to you diehards in the room, thanks for sticking around. Those are all of us. And to the virtual audience too, so thank you. And we can make this as interactive as you want. Um, I'm just thrilled to be here, first time back since 2020. And we're talking about such an important topic. It's important because of all the advancements you've heard um, from our colleagues today, whether it's technology or treatment or de early detection, they're all done on trials. So trials are not just exclusive for treatment trials. It could be anything we're investigating. Also, some of the comments about, you know, the, the challenges and barriers in healthcare, the trust issues, they all get heightened when you talk about trials. So the cancer piece is hard enough, knowing what to do next is hard enough, and then you layer in this really complicated topic of trials, and then you get to really see how difficult that makes that conversation which already feels like a biology lecture that you didn't want, but got forced on, which is unfortunate. But I think we'll just have a conversation about this. This is something I'm very passionate about. I've been practicing in Detroit for 20 years and have the honor and privilege of um, serving my community there. Um, and that is a very diverse community in Metro Detroit. So we see all sorts of challenges. These are some of the objectives that I'm hoping that we can at least address one is to understand some of these barriers, and maybe they're not your classical ones. So I'm trying to broaden your thinking about what disparity means. We tend to, again, equate it to race and ethnicity, but there could be more here, more that's right in the back of your yard and your community that you may not even recognize. And then what can we do, whether it's yourself, as a patient, as a supporter, as a caregiver, as a provider, as pharma? So everyone's got a role to play. It's a matter of being quite intentional about it. So when we talk about disparities, you know, we know about morbidity, mortality, those things you've heard multiple times today, whether it's the speaker to talk about, you know, treatment outcomes, screening, uh, anything. But there's incidents and survivorship care and quality of life that I think is dominating many of the conversations, at least that I have with my patients. And then the burden of cancer and other related conditions. So you can't just take one piece and say, I'm gonna tackle this, because it's like a domino. You, you tackle the one thing and then it just goes somewhere else. And then you say, gee, I solved these two things and then it goes somewhere else. So how, how do we do this? Well, you got to do it like it's a giant system, which it is, that we're all involved in. So how, how can we attack this? So we are sometimes familiar with race and ethnicity. You've heard it time and time again. But education is a factor where um, we tend to not think about this, you know, but your level of education matters in how you digest information not just the wrong information, misinformation, disinformation, but just everyday information and simple things of how do you get from point A to point B? What do you do when you talk to your health insurance provider? What's that even mean? I have a patient ask me that the other day. Go talk to your health insurance provider. He's like, who am I calling and what am I asking? That is a true disparity. Socioeconomic background, disability. We've talked about mental health disability, but there's plenty of learning disability that we don't see. So it's not a physical disability. It's not an over mental disability. Sometimes it's a learning disability. You have a processing disorder, you have ADHD. When you're trying to give vast amounts of information, um, they're struggling with listening to what you're saying and even understanding what you're saying you have to understand that that might impact how you deliver care and information. And then of course, gender and sexual identity, which is something that we almost know nothing about that is a learning curve for the entire community. These are statements, because sometimes you go, I'm not even sure what disparities mean, other than there's a sort of a difference in outcome. So these are statements that I like to put up there that makes you say, okay, here's an example of disparity. So people with lower socioeconomic status have disproportionately higher cancer death rates than those with higher socioeconomic status. Okay, that's a statement. So when you read that, you go, oh, that's, that's about socioeconomic status. We're, we're not talking about race. That you could have a different socioeconomic status that has nothing to do with race in your community. That might be your community. Might not be my community, but it might be yours. It might be two things together. Now you've got two factors. 
Individuals from medically underserved population are more likely to be diagnosed with late-stage disease that may have been treated more effectively or cured if diagnosed earlier. That is true for many different locations, but that term underserved is not the same in every community. So you have to figure out where are you? Many of you are the support group leaders, the advocates. Where are you in this community? What defines underserved? Who are you trying to address? Then you can develop your material accordingly. And here are some other examples. You know, for me, practicing in Detroit, where I do have many African-American men uh, in my uh, practice, they have the highest mortality rate of any racial or ethnic group for all cancers. So how am I taking that information? Well, I might be treating my patient with prostate cancer, but recognize that his wife is dealing with triple negative breast cancer at the same time, or lung cancer, or another cancer that you now recognize his particular situation has gotten more complicated. Why? Because he has to, to deal with his wife also being ill. So this isn't an exclusive problem for my patient. It's an exclusive problem for a family. It's the whole community. You look at Native Americans. You know, they never even sort of come up in conversation, and yet there are parts of my home state in Michigan that have a... Uh, American Indian population there, Native Americans. Cancer is their second leading cause of death at, uh, over the age of 45. 45! I mean, that is so young. So I'm not aware of many initiatives that really tackle that. It hasn't even been, been mentioned once, Native Americans, today in our, in our conversation. So I bring it up to also recognize that this group of underserved is really large. So think about who's in your backyard, really important. I like this cartoon a lot because it makes me think about what does it mean, not just for everyday care, but for trials. So we sometimes kind of booble up everything and say, well, it's equality, it's equity, it's sort of the same thing. Eh, if you're in practice where I am, it's not. So equality is something where everyone gets the same. So I want to go on a trial, Doc. That sounds great. Here's your gas card. Everyone, you get 50 bucks for this gas card, 50 bucks for you, 50 bucks for you. I have done great. Everyone's equal. But then you look at the equity at lens and you say, well, okay, 50 bucks for you because you got a car. 50 bucks for you, you don't have a car. What am I gonna, what's he going to do with that $50? He doesn't own a car. So that doesn't help me. And then 50 bucks, well, I live literally four hours away. 50 bucks is going to get me down to like, you know, two towns from where I live. So equal, 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 not helpful. Helpful to one, terrible, not enough, zero for the middle, not enough for the third. So when you're thinking trials, and I mean this also for sponsors and everybody, you got to recognize it's not a one-size-fits-all. So I might say, I'm going to cover your hotel fee, Terrific. I might say, I'm going to cover your gas fee. Terrific. It would just be easier if you just said, I will cover all forms of transportation, including Uber, which I can't ever get covered, taxis, because everyone deserves some sort of, you know, voucher, this and that. The system to fill out the taxi voucher is like four pages, and I'm already stressed out thinking about it, and I'd rather just give my patient the $20 to get home. So how do I do that? by understanding that the equity lens is 100% different than equality. So fight for that when you're getting the trials up and running. To that level of minutia when you're developing the contracts. Pharma in the room and on virtual. Think about what each community needs because what I need in Detroit is not the same as what they need in LA. It's not gonna be the same as what they need in Tampa, Florida. So ask. And it's okay to not make it so standard because you're serving different people. The next set of slides are not for you to get a quiz on, although I think Tom, if he's still here, probably gonna quiz you. Um, what it shows is that we're fascinated with knowing what people do. So the next set of slides is gonna be the kind of slides you see us in our scientific meetings spouting off. Okay, here's a bunch of data, here's some curves. And then you guys nod and go, okay, I can't read any of it and have no clue what you just said. 
<laughs> which is true. Sometimes we're like, okay, the curves look separate, okay. Um, what, what this tells us is what we're doing is we're paying attention about what's happening. So National Cancer Database looks at a whole bunch of different cancers throughout the U.S. and it kind of tells you what people do. So these sets of data are helpful to people like me to say, well, in general, if I look around at a period of time, these are some of the data that tell me maybe if you're a black man with prostate cancer, you might opt less to get surgery. It doesn't say why. There's no judgment in terms of why or why not. It just is. So is that important? It may be important if this is the community you serve and there may be a reluctance for some reason. And that reason might be different depending on the community. I don't know. But is that gap narrowing as per this, this data set? Sure. Is that important for me to know? Yes, because then I can spit this data out when I go, listen, is the reluctance for a certain reason? Is it just because a body of people, this is the knowledge base? Is it a cultural way of thinking? We don't know. So when I look at data sets like this, it's okay, thank you very much, I, I get it. And then you have other data sets and then, you know, trust me, I look at these and I go, oh gosh, what, it, what is this data telling me other than they're just sets of information that tells us in the world where we have to treat you and provide recommendations for you that we have an understanding of what it means and why people pick what they pick we don't know. We could tell you it's what they picked. So is that important? Yeah. If you got to translate all of these bullets and graphs and figures, you're darn tootin' it's really important. And you look at them knowing there are limitations. They're just big snapshots. And why I say these are becoming in line is what you're hearing nowadays is real world data. Who's heard of real world data getting presented? Yeah. Well, let me tell you that there's large data. Here's your phase three. Wow, here's the big impact. And then it's what happens in the real world. So I think Dr. Ryan mentioned that earlier. Okay, so we said drug X is gonna do better. So you should give drug X. Everyone agrees. We all, are, us professors, we agree. And then you get in real life, you're like, oh, okay, what did the other doctors do in real life? And the answer is, uh, oops, the message didn't get out. So. I can say all of this, but if the clinical trials tell you one thing and your actual practice does another, there's a disconnect in information. So how do we fix that? With things like, uh, you know, summits like this, with all of you in the audience spreading the word. The other part that always gets missed as well is this concept of ethnicity. So we talked a lot about race and everyone at least gets the conversation to be something not so foreign. Let me tell you where we bomb out all the time, ethnicity. We didn't even talk about it. We kind of glossed it over. Maybe it's Latinx, Hispanic, is it Latino? Those are the definitions right there. I gotta tell you, when I show this slide to other um, organizations, People are like, I never thought there was a difference between Hispanic and Latino. Because when you fill out your forms, it's Hispanic slash Latino. But Hispanic are those who descend from Spanish-speaking countries, and Latino are those who, who come from Latin American countries. If you look at that graph, it's the only time I'm gonna actually have you look a little closer, and you see prostate cancer there, which is the middle sort of grouping. If you're a Cuban from Florida, or a Mexican from Florida, or a Puerto Rican from Florida, you will have different incidence rates for these cancers. They're not the same, folks. So do we know why? No, I didn't say we know why. Remember, all these data sets are just, here's the information, do with it what you will. But if you're in a community that serves a particular group, maybe you gotta realize that Cubans in Florida have a higher risk of this prostate cancer than Puerto Ricans in Florida. So who's in your backyard? Who's the community that you're serving? Super important. Talk about another disparity, rural versus urban. Who's really thought about this in terms of where you live? Okay, that's probably just me raising my hand, <laughs> maybe one other person. You know that this issue of rural versus urban is completely missed most of the time. It's a huge disparity. In Michigan, it's the middle of our state, and I have to say probably 
Um, we have two NCI designated cancer centers where I work at Carmanis and then University of Michigan. I think we both do an equally lousy job. I'm just gonna throw Michigan under the bus because you know, that's what we do in all fairness. Um, but the middle of the state doesn't get service from either. Now, if you look at a registry from Pennsylvania, which the tidbit of the day is Pennsylvania has the third largest rural population in the United States. So if you're not from Pennsylvania, you may not know that. For those of you sitting here who are now aware of that, it's really important for you to go back to your home state and go, what, where are our rural populations? Do I know? Can I do more as a zero advocate and caregiver and just someone who's in the know to help someone in my home state knowing that there is an issue. There is a disparity here. Rural residents are just less likely to get treatment even by, by stratifying by disease risk. And if even if you say, okay, it's because nobody lives there. No, no, that's not true. If you count for the urologist density, which means you make sure, oh, there's a doctor there, they're still not receiving the care. Think about what an impact zero can make there. Huge, huge impact. And then if you get on your high horse and you say, well, you know, those of us in academic centers, we're gonna treat much better. Uh, I don't think that's the case because the same database tells you that, well, maybe both of us, us and the community sites, are maybe not doing as great of a job, period. So there's no difference. So the majority of cancer care these days is happening in your backyard. And that is a reality that we have to come to terms with, that your advocacy really needs to go everywhere in the state that you represent, because it's not just, oh, I'm in a rural or an urban area where there's an NCI designated cancer center, that's where you have to go. Because most people don't have the means or the want, or sometimes the trust to go out. So if that's the case, bring it in. We know enough to bring it in. Some things you can't do, many things you can in your backyard. Now the next series of slides are the ones that put everyone to sleep. So I'm gonna bypass those quick, why? Because I'm just gonna show you that these curves are to show that if you can get patients the treatment, so the treatment is the same, your outcome is the same. We keep hearing that today, right? You can get the treatment. Now, these are all trials that I'm gonna blow through here in the next series. Why is that important? Because that attributes that a whole access. Access because your socioeconomic status doesn't lend itself. Where you live, your zip code doesn't lend itself. Your insurance doesn't lend itself. Your own education and awareness doesn't lend itself. Here's a pellucil T. We talked about sometimes it's the same. This is in a case where it's potentially better, where black men actually live longer. We never talked about better, we just said good as. There's a potential for better, and that's only in one group. What if we thought about it bigger? Now, we just didn't do it, so no trials. Here's a graph where everyone's gonna have to squint and go, what the heck is that? What that is, is just looking at standard chemotherapy that's around since 2004. You know what it shows? It shows that whoever got treated by docetaxel chemotherapy, your survival is the same. So when you say, how do I know that my survival is the same once we do all these trials? Because that's the data, that's 10 large trials. That's 8,820 men who bravely participated in these trials to get that answer. So when there's a trust issue that comes up to say, how do I know this docetaxel is gonna be it for me? Other than you say, well, it may be the right thing for you, maybe not, but there should be no level of mistrust or distrust in this case to say, well, I don't know if you know. Now, the thing that's a bummer is the black population and Asians don't represent that much of this grouping. So part of this talk is how do we diversify the people who actually sign up? That is a you know 500 uh, bullet long uh, discussion in terms of why we struggle, but here's the data. So, so it's not zero, and we're gonna get into that in a minute in terms of what are the actual numbers, but it shows when you can get on, you will do the same. 
And I think that is the messaging that has to come across from all of you zero experts because that lessens in a way the worry and concern that you're not doing the same thing for everyone. And the, the fact is that you are. And the same data goes for radium. This is a smaller study, but at least it's a look to see, especially in this group where there are men treated at the VA, that in a way, if anything, mm, a hint here, that black men who received radium actually had a decreased risk of mortality. So you're starting to see hints that it's not just all about equal outcomes in this case, there might be better. We never thought about clinical trials where there's a better. It's always just as a good as. So think about that model as we're thinking ahead now in the next 10 years. How do we think about that? Here's one with abiraterone where we participated in with Duke University. You know, it's interesting because some people will always say, well, hang on a second, hang on a second. I don't know if my PSA is gonna go down as good as the next person. How do I know this is going to be the case? I'm just showing you raw data right there that says that actually, if you look at how many percent of people got a reduction in their PSA with this medicine, uh, if you look at the black group, those numbers tend to look just higher. Again, forget the statistical significance and blah, 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 that we're all gonna pontificate as professors, but I'm just giving you numbers where you can say, you know what, that's not bad. That's activity, that's activity. And that's what you want to convey. Sometimes the other way to look at it is, by you not doing something, is there a potential for harm? So not as good as, not better, but is it potentially worse? So this was another study and I highlighted that just bicalutamide, which is your standard everyday medication before all the fancy drugs showed up, Actually, if you look at the seven month PSA response rate, it was actually worse with bicalutamide. So even if you think you're not gonna do something new and it's not gonna help, you might actually shortchange somebody to the worst level by not doing what is technically standard or potentially standard. So there is always a different way of how we think about this, which then really comes down to this. How do I improve these numbers? Look at these numbers. Two to three percent of all US patients will enroll in a trial. That's a big sigh, because it's such a heavy lift. I put just Michigan, since that's my home state. We strive to get 4.4 percent of Michiganders to participate in trials. 4.4 percent. That was a pillar that went from 4 to 4.4 percent in five years. It should be 40 percent for zero, not four. Let's go an even worse number of those who did or will participate, 6.2 percent were African American. So you have a small number to an even smaller number to now a minuscule number. And then you say, why are we making no advancements? Those are the cold, hard facts. Pretty disturbing if you really think about no one is, the people at the most risk, you've heard all day today, not showing up to where hopefully we can advance that. And it's just not trials. So you could see the trials, okay, but genomics, you've heard it again and again. How do you know how to advance precision medicine if you don't know the genes? How do you not know the genes, pure and simple? Awareness, awareness, that's gotta be top on the list. The number of patients I see myself in my own practice, and I have a very busy practice, and you say genes and genomics, half of the people are looking at you like, I don't even understand what that word means. That's one. Number two, they say, I don't know where I came from in terms of I didn't know so-and-so in my family. I, no one talks about the cancer word, the C word. No one talks about the C word. So family history is unknown. But you don't need to know all of that. You yourself can advocate for your patient, whether it's yourself or your family member or a person in your community, to say, please put your samples in. It is not something you should worry about in terms of who gets the data. There are rules, federal, state, everything, that makes things very, not just confidential, but 
no misuse, at least we try hard, but that we've learned from years of work, only 12% in the, the cancer genome atlas. You know what that is? That's the federal government saying, we're gonna sequence everyone. Come on in, we're gonna sequence everyone. So all the data we have to work with today comes from that, 12% of samples. Shouldn't it be 50? Should it be more? We don't know. And what about imaging? We've been going on about PSMA. Here's one that was just a different tracer, flacicavine, 11%, 11%. I look at that and I think, okay, uh, nearly 90% of men did not get the state-of-the-art PET scan. Yikes, how do you know where your cancer is? How do you know what to do next? You're not getting the best of the best. So the disparity in these accruals, these are all trials, by the way, it's a total bummer. It's a bummer, and honestly, it can't last because we are not doing right by anyone. We're going to get in the next set of slides down deep in terms of how many studies are really out there that we're making these big decisions that you're helping to advocate. So um, a group of us decided to kind of look and say, where are all these trials coming from? What kind? Just specific to prostate cancer. So we're going to look at race, ethnicity, um, representation of these in three different buckets. So we've talked a lot about treatment today. But what about prevention and screening? We don't talk a lot about that that much because it's, it's hard to do. But here's a study where we looked across what got published. And you know, the things that get published are the ones we know. There's plenty of stuff that doesn't get published, but not the big ticket studies. The big ticket studies get published. So let's look at this, and I'm, this is the one I am gonna go a little bit slower so we can all take a look at the numbers. So here's 295 phase three to four trials for prostate cancer. Now three, you guys know, means you're kind of looking at drug A versus B. Two is like, I wonder if drug A kind of works in prostate cancer. And, and phase one is, gosh, I really hope drug A is safe, okay? So three is kind of, in a way, for trials, the easiest for patients to grasp because it'd be like, hey, here's your standard and I got something I'm gonna compare it to. So a lot of us will then that turn that around and say, hey, FDA, we now have proven that this drug is better than this drug, okay? So we excluded right off the bat almost 200 of them because there's no results. Now, that's a bummer, and honestly, the other thing we need to advocate for is you do a trial, positive or negative, you need to publish. So the way our world works is that if it's a negative trial, we have a hard time getting it published because no one wants to read that it was a bust. And if it's published, it's maybe 10, 15 years after the fact. So we need to push on that. But then here, 96 trials made the cutoff. And we had to exclude some more due to the variety of these reasons. And now what are we down to? We have five screening trials. We have four primary prevention trials. And we have 63 tr um, trials that were mostly treatment. Okay, so screening, prevention, treatment. Those numbers are still kind of low, right? But there's something. It's something that we can hang our hat on. So if you look at kind of this by year. So you can just see that it's 85 to 89, then all the way up to 2019. And you could see the buckets of people. You could see that the buckets of people are mostly white men. And everyone else is a tiny little blip on this figure. That's not right. And it's a disappointment, but that's reality of the trials that are right now published that dictate our standard of care today. Okay, sorry for the small numbers. I just, I'm down to the brass tacks. And so if you really look at just the actual numbers circled there, are you not surprised at how low they really are? And if I could actually read them out loud, I would, but I can't see that well. So I'm gonna walk over. Okay.
OK. Have we not just talked about how every men are not presenting at later stage and those numbers are so disappointing to read? 0 0.5 under screening. Yeah, that's, that's my shocked face too when, we, when we, we saw this. So could we do better in this? Sure, if we ever got around to another large screening trial. But that percentage alone should motivate all of us to get the word out that maybe there will never be a screening trial. And yes, the data keeps changing, but I, I think we got to get there. How do we get there where all these trials that I just said, where this is the global map, uh, they're sort of not done in the countries where you think prostate cancer might have a really high risk and high incidence. So you look at South America and Africa, not so great. Not so great at all. So we need to now think also as a community globally. So whatever we're doing here impacts the rest of the world. So your messaging impacts the rest of the world. We have to do better. So not only were our numbers dismal in the countries that have, I think they're going to even be potentially worse in the countries that don't have. So we have to think about this a little bit more global, and that's really important. It's also important to say most of these trials really were sparse on reporting any race ethnicity, let alone geographic location, rural versus urban status, socioeconomic status, education status. None of that made the cutoff. I just showed you that those all contribute to disparity. So how do we do that? We might have to demand to our pharma sponsors and any sponsor that should be part of the reporting. We need to collect and we need to report. Hasn't happened yet, folks. So can we as an advocacy movement here do that? I think we can, that's an easier lift. You guys need to get in there and say, oh, this is like the bare minimum. How do we even know what we're reporting? And they're all self-identified. We don't need fancy stuff to check the box. How you think of yourself, that's it. You know, in Metro Detroit, we have a huge Middle Eastern population. There's no box for them to check. The NCI does not recognize, you know, folks in the Middle East as a particular other subgroup. So they're always struggling. They're like, um, am I putting other? Am I putting Caucasian, non-Hispanic slash Latino? What am I actually checking off on my food? I don't know. I should know, but I don't know. So there's a movement now to add the box. You don't add the box, nobody fills it in right or the same. So that's a huge group that I serve. We have almost no data. Forget the language barrier, just no data. So we need, we could see here already a deficiency on screening trials. So if we're now thinking, uh-oh, numbers are up, we're having more shared decision-making moments. Whoa, what are we doing with this? Will there ever be a large screening trial? Maybe not. So whether that comes through or not, what you guys can do is spread the word because you know that those numbers are so small. Even though the last thing there, in treatment trials, you're at 6.7%. 6.7%. Now, you're going to say, well, what's the right number? Hey, Dr. Heath, what's the right number? I get that a lot. Well, okay, right here, African-American men comprise mostly, almost 13% of our U.S. population. Okay, so that's there. I think we decided that 22% is the bare minimum enrollment, 22%. So is that achievable? I think so, if we all sort of pile in and do the right thing, and that, let me just tell you how hard that is, we all know in this room, but we are, making slow progress, but it needs to be faster. The numbers are not gonna fix themselves. It needs to go faster. The FDA has guidance on this, so they have a plan. Here's some of theirs, and I'm happy to you know, say that go on their website, it's there as a full PDF document. Encourage sponsors to use real world data. What's that mean? Well, figure out how we prescribe after the fact and then figure out what other comorbidities are in the patients we prescribe, because you know what happens in real life. It's the perfect patient group going on the study, 
And then when it's out, every, it's a free-for-all. Oh, it's a free-for-all. We have diabetes. All right, we're doing it. Oh, I've had a heart attack three months ago. We're still doing it because you're dying of your cancer. I think I had a stroke. We're still doing it. So we're treating the patients because they need to be treated. Are they the perfect patient? No. Many people are not, which makes trials hard. What about using real-world data so you can see safety? You can look at these kinds of parameters. How about looking at the data that exists in our electronic health records that we are tortured about every day to make sure we document, document. What are we documenting for if we're not extracting this good amount of information? So let's extract it. Let's use it. And then let's describe some specific strategies. The FDA agrees. Let's know your site location, sustain community engagement, reducing burdens, presence of advocates, patients navigators, nurse navigators. What do, what do, what do people have? What I have in my backyard is not what you guys have in your backyard. I guarantee it. And if you're not making those goals, what are we doing? Are we going to stop it? You know, where pharma usually says is you keep it open too long, it's a lot of money. Okay. Then if you shut it, are we going to collect it after the fact? It's now approved. Are you going to do it after the fact? If not, why not? FDA says I think that's a strategy. I think we need to endorse that. So if you can't do it up front, let's get it after, because you know you're going to be treated. We mentioned here, I think Dr. Cunningham mentioned, the Iron Man Registry, which we are an active participant. They look at this experience for men and physicians who then fill out questionnaires, patients fill out questionnaires, we get blood. Why is this important? Because it's global. This is a registry that recognizes what happens in the U.S. may be different in our Canadian friends, to Australian friends, to elsewhere. Is that critical? Oh yeah, it's critical. We need to really understand this issue of how patients are doing with their treatment, um, you know, whether it's active or you're in survivorship care. It's an engagement. I have many patients on this and they feel like they're part of the fight. They are feeling like they're contributing their data, their knowledge, their experience to really help um, what we do. What are we doing in Detroit? We're actually trying to better the providers. So one of the strategy is this uh, project which finally finished and we really wanted to offer intervention to the doctors because it's a multi-level problem. It isn't always what are we doing Let's to educate the patients. Sometimes the doctors and the providers need education and we need some improvement in what we do. What did we find? We found that most people, when offered a trial, said yes. You know the sticking point? We didn't have that many trials to offer because they weren't eligible, because they were in a point in time where they didn't need something, because the trial wasn't open, because there wasn't a spot. So many reasons. But the other part to this was that there was a difference in how my black patients and the white patients receive the information. So there was still a level of distrust. And I do recognize distrust is not always mistrust. You know, distrust is what does the patient experience. Mistrust is just a general kind of ick factor, like, oh, I don't know. You do want to, mm, I don't know. But distrust is like, oh, I know, because this thing happened to me, so I know. So I'm very careful to ask, what is preventing you? What is the concern? And let me tell you the one thing that's happened that I've noticed in my practice in the last few years with the pandemic. Our worry about, you know, um, the Tuskegee experiments and Gila are perhaps our, this generation, our older generation, the younger generation who are, as Dr. Loeb pointed out, relying on TikTok and Instagram, are worried about the COVID vaccine conspiracy and the mistrust of health providers, and it's getting glommed into one giant mess. So the grandpas that are coming to see me, who's getting driven by the grandson or the granddaughter who's relying on social media and getting sort of misinformation, is saying absolutely not to trials. No, granddad, I gotcha. This verbatim, no, granddad, I gotcha. Well, well, what just happened? I got you for what? What's happening? I got you, you're doing the standard. Okay, this is like a easy, it's the same type of drug. 
no recovery from my conversation. I've been doing this a long time because they know that what I was saying is not 100% truthful because of what she's seen on TikTok and what her brother saw on, you know, Instagram. So all of a sudden, I'm presented with a new barrier that literally never existed pre-COVID. So is that important? Yes, because now it makes something like this, like, okay, well, I'm gonna do this, but what? So we're doing other things now where we are using more artificial intelligence as well. Here's a program where it's sort of motion energy analysis, you know, I, and this honestly came about because I kind of torture our behavioral oncology folks to say, all right, come on, just give me the top three tips. Am I leaning forward using my left hand going, so what do you think? Or am I going to go, you take your time and that, you know, what is my movement to see if the trust could be built? And they're all laughing at me like, you know, there's no formula. Okay, well maybe after this there could be. Because if a patient takes a step back and says, whoa, then maybe the answer is we stop the conversation at that moment and say, let's revisit. So we can do better and use sort of artificial intelligence to help us figure out how we can talk about trials and address concerns where it's the most appropriate. I also got to give it to the NCI for really recognizing this. So the other thing I always say to colleagues that are saying, well, I don't have this in my backyard to help sort of figure out the disparity education. You don't need to because we're all part of this NCI effort where you, depending on where you live, are part of a region. And within this geographic management of Cancer Health Disparities Program, they have oodles of educational um, material. So in addition to what you're learning on zero, it could be something very specific to your region. So, you know, in Michigan, we're, I can't read that, but it's, I'm the purple, I know that. But we look often to see how that can supplement the educational materials that we provide. So I encourage you, go on their website. I'm always uh, surprised at how great it is. And then, you know, you're part of a network too. So reach out to others that maybe, you know, maybe there are others in your region that you could do something with. Um, together as part of zero. That's another way to sort of mitigate disparities. For the providers in the room, and I mean any level of provider, not just doctor, but there's so many, social worker, psychologist, nutritionist, what can we do to mitigate the disparity that you all just heard me say today? And it's on many, many levels. Try to individuate. Every person, every man with prostate cancer has a different journey. There's no two men that has had the same experience. And sometimes when you're busy practice, you're running around, you lump people. That's a bad plan. So individuate, find out what makes that man tick and what is his family structure. Hopefully he has one. If not, what's his social structure? Teach the skills. So I always say whatever I learn in a meeting, I give it back to our, our um, you know, clinic group and then they pass it on, and then so on and so on. But patient-centered communication skills is something I bet you that you have in your community that you probably haven't thought about using. Create this in-group identity. And then more importantly, you may look at the patients differently, but keep your standard treatments a certain level. Don't start going, well, I can't really offer that trial to him. I mean, it doesn't look like he drove here. And you know, he's at least two hours out. And you know what the answer is going to be? Are you kidding me? Of course you're going to offer that uh, clinical trial or that treatment. Why? Because you don't know their circumstance. And this happened to a fellow who's like, oh, he came in and he's like, no, he's definitely, uh, did you offer him the trial? We talked about this. We role played. Did you do the trial? And he goes, no, no, listen, he's up from the UP. So you guys know Michigan way, way up. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's no way he's going to come. And I'm like, I just thought we talked about this. So I go in and I said, you know, we're going to talk about this study. He's like, okay, that sounds great. So my fellow says, hey, don't you live in the UP? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. But my daughter lives right here in Southfield, Michigan. So I'll just stay with her during the trial. Is that okay with you, Doc? So after I went to my fellow, it was a great learning experience. So it taught him to not judge as to what people's circumstance may be. 
offer, really important, and encourage. What can patients do? I think there's a lot patients can do. First of all, you're doing it today, which is educating yourself on what's new. What are the trials? And I think um, uh, Keith had mentioned uh, earlier, how many trials, hundreds of trials. You want to get in a trial, there's probably a trial for you somewhere. Ask questions about the team. You know, say, hey, what's your goal of care for me? Instead of, oh, we're going to start this treatment. Everybody jumps into the treatment. Well, here it is. You're going to show up on this Wednesday and sign this form. You're going to get this. Hold up. What's my overall goal of care? What's the big picture, doc? Increase your awareness of your own surroundings. Go on that NCI website. Go on Zero's websites. Connect to people around you because what you have in your region, in your backyard, is going to be different than somebody else's. And no person should really be denied that because you're amazed sometimes. I'm amazed. I go around and I look. The resources for patients are astounding as long as you look. So pass it on. The other part is share your story with family and friends. Share with them. Don't be scared. These are, we are past the, I had cancer. No, you're past that. No more going to whisper it, embrace it, and talk about your family history and participate, participate, participate in a trial. Here, I think the one thing that we all can do is everyone looks to you guys and gals for your level of expertise. And they're going to ask you, well, as a person who's gone through it, what would you do? And if you endorse it because you wholly believe that a clinical trial is a good next step, they're going to listen to you because you're their peer. You're someone that's been through it or you're the caregiver or someone that's been through it. I think that's super important. And also, ask to the critical question of, am I getting the standard? And that's a fair question to your doctor and your team. Am I getting the standard? And please, use every resource. And I can't just thank enough for the Zero group. And by the way, I've always called it Zero Prostate Cancer, so I guess I was saying it wrong the whole time. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I think there's multiple levels of this. I think it's really all up to us as a community to really try to just reduce this disparity gap and really make this equitable for all. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for Zero. Questions or no questions? Okay, a minute for questions. Wowzer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You are living proof of how that works. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing your story. I think that's really important for all of us to hear. And that is a message you all should share. 
It could be any trial. It could be anything you participate. Pa that's how you pass it forward, because then it really makes others like you not so afraid. And it is, it's scary. Everything you're going through is scary. It's scary on this end, too, because we don't want to get it wrong, you know? But thank you for, sh for sharing your story. Yes, sir. divide where you talk about equity versus equality yeah. where a white and I'm from Pennsylvania your state that you mentioned where a white HR manager I'm not trying to but you know from history will say well I gave everybody an equal chance but we hired the white person but you know people hire from the networks that they're connected to not even intentionally and they don't realize yeah. the subliminal you know that they're reaching out to where they come from they're not trying to make the decision I'm wondering if if there's that same bias in outreach of, of, of clinical trials that they're not trying to exclude yeah. but necessarily, but they're outreaching into their comfortable channels. Yeah. And they yeah. need to be exactly. aware of that to reach out. So I want to go the opposite end of that for a second. My question, I do have a question, which is we talk about the Asians low. It goes farther than that. I'm, we're a medical device manufacturer for prostate cancer equipment. Oh. Not only is Asian lower, Japan Mm -hmm. is non-existent to the point that we don't even bother trying to sell, and I'm not my, my little company, but the major MR scanner companies don't even bother trying to deal with prostate cancer in Japan because it doesn't exist. Are there variables, have they discovered, in Japan particularly that are non-genetic that we can transfer, yeah. you know, to other yeah. socioeconomic ethnic groups that yeah. to help bring that down anyways? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I can't say that I'm an expert on that topic other than, you know, a lot of dietary and environmental factors have been looked at. Um, but I think it also really showcases why our research needs to be global. Because the complete opposite of that is why there are parts of Africa that are so high that, that men are dying literally every day, every few hours, you know, complete opposite, complete opposite. So I think we need to be thoughtful of where to put the resources. You know, if a group doesn't need it, it's okay to say, hey, you don't need it. It's there if you need it, but you don't need it. Let's focus. But I think sometimes we get nervous about that. I don't think so. I think that cartoon is there to help us say, what is really the difference? Ideally, we have no fence. Ideally, that's, that's really the big win for everyone but that's not there right now, so we can only do what we can. But I think if you recognize every person needs something different, that's, I think, the, the big ticket message. Yeah. I ran into an interesting uh, problem um, when faced with a clinical trial where my oncologist told me that I had to have two pre-qualifying treatments, which was chemotherapy and then some form of ADT in order to benefit or qualify or be accepted or asked into a trial yeah. that um, presumably has immediate health or uh, extent of life uh, benefits for me. Now, in my particular case, and I don't know if I'm an outlier in this or not, um, I was diagnosed Gleason 9, 48 years old, no genetic uh, background at all, no history. Um, I'm from the suburbs. I'm half white. I'm half black. Um, yeah. Crazy. I, I take care of myself. I eat well. I exercise. Um, so it's cra as you can imagine, it was crazy when I got hit it's with crazy. this in 2020 yeah. that I was stage 9 terminal cancer right from yeah. the jump. Um, I did not have any prostatectomy because I was already advanced at diagnosis. So I went straight to ADT, straight to Lupron, and I did not fare well on it. It was absolutely horrible, which I'm sure anyone that's been on ADT knows I don't need to explain it. Um, but I, I suffered from incredible 
uh, drenching hot flashes every yeah. hour. It was torture. I don't want to get into that. But the point being is that through my own proactive means, I found that estrogen therapy worked mm -hmm. with controlling those hot flashes. So I had stopped taking Lupron, started doing estrogen, and the quality of my life increased overnight. It was incredible. Um, but now that I got accepted to this trial, yeah. and I'm getting to a question. <laughs> when I got accepted for the trial, my oncologist told me, nope, you have to go back on the shot before we can allow you into this trial. Um, that was two weeks ago. And even though the estrogen is, is helping a lot, I could feel those, those yeah. same patterns of hot flashes coming back in. So I guess my question to you is, is, is this a is this a construct within the industry? Is it an insurance thing? Is it um, your financial situation? Like, wh what is it? Who's determining who gets yeah. that care and who doesn't? And why do we have to jump through these hoops of things that we don't? I, I don't want to poison myself yeah. if I don't have to. Um, and I, I'm not disregarding the benefits of chemotherapy. It's kept a lot of people alive when, when that's the only choice you have. Sure. For me, it's kind of a last resort thing. I don't want to do chemotherapy, right. but I don't want to suffer from the standard of care. Yeah. And I don't think that, at least in my case, my oncologist really appreciated the torture that I was going mm -hmm. through. And I, I had to become my own advocate for it. And I'm doing much better today. But I guess my question is, yeah. is there anything Why? from your knowledge or your yeah. experience that can answer that question for me? Well, I think the, the big thing is, first of all, thank you for sharing, you know, what's happened to you, your journey. I think every time one of us does that, it's really helpful to everyone else. I think the second thing is what you describe is our hell, too, honestly. And I say the H-E double hockey sticks because... What you feel is our world that, and the folks who do trials. We have to comply with the multiple bullet points as to why you have to be a certain way or how much treatment you've had or your lab values. A lot of that is because of the constraints of the regulatory process. So, you know, they want everybody to look as much the same as possible. And that's why one of the FDA sort of suggestions potentially is to use real world data to say not everyone has perfect blood sugars, perfect experience with ADT, perfect results with chemotherapy. We want to relax those so much. Most trials for everyone here who don't know may have inclusion exclusion to the level where there are 50, five, zero bullet points. You have to uh, talk about jumping hoops, that's me. Oh, the kidney's good, oh, oh, we're off by 0 0.1, you're not eligible. Has that happened? Oh, all the time. I know Dr. Morgans is in the audience, this is our struggle, what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? Oh, your hemoglobin, 8.9, up, oh, 0.1 off, darn. So we get that, trust me, we're with there with you. I think we can plead to our regulatory agencies they're aware of our frustration. Pharma knows. Pharma has to comply with some of these rules. We have pushed back time and time again. When I was a fellow training at Johns Hopkins, I wrote a phase two trial. It was 30 pages, and there were maybe five bullet points to get in. One was being a guy. Two with, with uh, well, actually, in this case, it was esophageal cancer, and you failed one chemo. Literally, that was it. Now we have protocols that are 180 pages with 50 bullet points. So, and you guys have to sign papers that are 20, 30 pages long to say you understood what I just said. Right. So we've gone from to whoa. And then you wonder, what did she just say? And I take a lot of time with every patient. So one, you may not be a candidate right now. It doesn't mean you're not a candidate in the future. Two, you can do more than one trial in your lifetime, and we encourage it. We encourage it. Many of my patients are what I call the frequent offenders. When they get to number five, ding, 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 we have a party. They get to number two, ding, 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 we have a party. So if you can do more, you contribute, your service is, it's a blessing. So you may not be right right now. There'll be another one for you down the road. Yes, in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. I hear you. Yeah. You are preaching to the choir. I think everyone here, whether you're a patient or a provider, feels the same way. So the advocacy voice, right, the advocacy voice, yeah. Well, I think, you know, and I, I don't want to throw Shelby under the bus. Oh, look, here she That's is. Fine. <laughs> That's fine. It's on, you know, potentially an agenda item in addition to fundraising, right, to say we want to maybe change the regulatory landscape. Sometimes it takes all of us, mostly you guys, patients and survivors, to make it happen. Please. I am not a clinician. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a researcher. All I am is a survivor. Get another doctor. Go to another facility. Advocate for yourself. Go where you can get the treatment. And I'll drop some names if you want me to. <laughs> All right? I'm serious because this is your body. This is your life. These are your feelings. Other than that, it's not, we can't beat the system up, but we can advocate for ourselves. This is how you feel. That was fantastic. Thank you.